there, Tani Yap, Kuyget Yuan's Queen's Ma. Hi everybody, my name is Kuyget Yuan's. I'm a member of the Squamish Nation and the Yagalanis Clan of the Haida Nation. You're listening to Co-op Radio, CFRO 100.5 FM. We live, work, play, and broadcast from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Nations. We are broadcasting from the unceded Coast Salish territories on Turtle Island. A shout out to the programmers and listeners who keep community radio alive, producing alternative media often ignored by the mainstream. We are tuned into Buland Awaz and followed by The Rational on CFRO 100.5 FM, Vancouver's original choice for authentic public affairs from a people of color perspective. We've been hosting two hours of critical discussion on relevant issues weekly on Mondays at this time. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in and for your continued support for the show. Today, we'll be speaking with Gavin Barrett and Julian Franklin of People of Color in Advertising and Marketing on their second visible and vocal survey, focusing on the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. Before that, on The Rational, we are looking forward to be joined by David Robinson, Executive Director for Canadian Association of University Teachers on their opposition to adopting the IHRA definition. And before David Robertson, we'll be speaking with Amanda Sum, Ghazal Azarabad, Rogi Yu, who are part of the cast in Theatre Replacement's East Van Panto, their rendition of Alice in Wonderland, following White Rabbit onto the sky train, falling down through a hole, and finding herself in a Grand View Woodlands Wonderland, running through to January the 2nd at the York Theatre. But before that, we'll be speaking with Marilyn Mosley, the Honorary Counsel for Barbados in BC, and co-host Eve Engler on their recent ejection of the monarchy and going for a republic. Stay tuned. We'll be right back with all of that. The Halusa Nation. The human beings. The people. See the spiritual in the natural. Through sense and feeling. Everything is related. All the things of earth and in the sky have spirit. Everything is sacred. Confronted by the alien nation, the subjects and the citizens see the material religions through trauma and numb. Nothing is related. All the things of the earth and in the sky have energy to be exploited. Even themselves, mining their spirits into souls sold into nothing is sacred, not even their self. The Ally Nation, Alien Nation. to CFRO 100.5 FM. Coming up, we are going to be joined with Gavin Barrett and Julian Franklin of People of Color in Advertising and Marketing. 
in their on their second visible and vocal survey focusing on the experiences of black indigenous and people of color but before that coming right up we will be joined with David Robinson, Executive Director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers on their opposition to adopting the IHRA definition. This is Scaling New Heights by the Asian Dub Foundation. We're going to go back to that and come right back. Still are tuned into the airwaves at CFRO 100.5 FM and streaming at you at www.coopradio.org. This is The Rational, and as promised, we are joined by David Robinson, the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, on their opposition to adopting the IHRA definition. Prior to joining Canadian Association of Teacher of University Teachers, Robinson was the senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He has also been a lecturer at Simon Fraser University and Carleton University. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you for having me. So could you start by letting listeners know what the work is of the CAUT? What What are you guys focused in on primarily? Sure, yeah, the Canadian Association of University Teachers is a national federation uh, of faculty associations from across the country representing a little over 70,000 academic staff at uh, universities and colleges in all provinces. And our primary work uh, is focusing on defending rights of the profession. We negotiate collective agreements, uh, but we also uh, um, focus on defending other rights such as tenure and academic freedom, um, just in addition to the employment gains that, uh, that, that we seek to, do, to achieve for our members. How old is the organization? Uh, the organization was founded in 1951, so I think we're in our, just, uh, just closing out our 70th year in operation. Okay, well, congratulations. So this is um, this H, uh, IHRA definition has really been um, a wedge, uh, hasn't it? Especially around campuses and and universities. How how long has this been on the table for for you guys as an organization to decide which one way or the other? Um, it hasn't been uh, on the table that long for us. Certainly. Yeah, we see in other jurisdictions where elements of the definition are taken up uh, in ways that uh, create problems for scholars who do critical work in the Middle East, and particularly scholars who are critical of the Israeli government's uh, policies uh, towards uh, Palestinians. Uh, We hadn't seen it uh, arise too much here in Canada. There was a attempt by the Ford government in Ontario to incorporate the, the definition into law. Uh, they eventually made some minor amendments to an order in council, not as broad as what they originally were doing. The federal liberal government was also looking at adopting the, the definition and has done so uh, for some internal practices, but again, it doesn't have uh, legislative force. I think looking at other jurisdictions where many of our members, and this resolution came from the membership, it grew organically. It didn't come from the leadership of the AAT, but a lot of our members were looking at uh, the impact on certain disciplinary studies, uh, particularly uh, Middle East studies, uh, and looking at other jurisdictions where colleagues were, uh, were raising concerns about the interpretation of the definition that would, that would equate uh, any criticism of the state of Israel or its policies uh, nece- necessarily with anti-Semitism, uh, which would then, of course, put academics or critics uh, in a particularly difficult position. So had there been issues that have come up recently that, uh, well, that you can point to in, in the Canadian context? Well, there are certainly issues around Middle East politics. It's a, it's a thorny, complicated, and very uh, controversial topic. And we have had run-ins in the past, and most recently, just uh, last year, uh, over the course of the past year, we were dealing with a case at the University of Toronto uh, where uh, following a a search for a director of the International Human Rights Program in the Faculty of Law, 
a job offer was made uh, to a scholar who, uh, amongst her work, uh, had done uh, work on the Palestinian question and has raised, in her view, concerns about uh, whether or not the state of Israel was complying with international law. Uh, we then found out that a, a donor a, a, and also a sitting judge with the tax court in Canada contacted the university to raise concerns about this uh, potential hiring, and the hiring was suddenly scuttled. Right. And uh, we went through a long process in which we discussed within our Academic Freedom and Tenure Committee. We imposed censure on the University of Toronto, which is sort of our ultimate sanction against the university. And fortunately, we were able to, over the course of the past few months, uh, resolve it with the university. And, and can you talk a little bit more about what that resolution was? I mean, w with the university, what happened then? Uh, well, the uh, principal resolution is uh, we uh, worked with the university and convinced them to uh, re-offer the job uh, to, to the candidate who had been uh, turned down or had been offered the job and then, then turned down, so the job was re-offered. And so that satisfied most of our principal concerns. Mm -hmm. The university also agreed to make some changes to its uh, his donor policy uh, to make it clear that the donors uh, cannot influence or comment on uh, hiring processes or any, any other academic decision at the university. And they also agreed, and I think really importantly, to extend academic freedom protections to positions like the director of the International Human Rights Program, which has both sort of managerial responsibilities, but also academic responsibilities. And that was a real turnaround because the university initially was arguing, well, it's not really an academic position, right? and therefore academic freedom doesn't really apply. Uh, mm. But we argued that, no, there were academic duties here and academic responsibilities, and clearly there's some you know, fundamental problems if a donor is concerned about someone's or a candidate's research and is able to scuttle that hiring. That's a violation not just of academic freedom but also institutional autonomy. In integrity as well, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we've seen this, um, I mean, we've, we've seen news of, of this kind of influence uh, going around in, in the United States. We've, we've heard about it here in this mm -hmm. Canadian context. Uh, how how prevalent is this within our university institutions? Are you, are you able to speak to that at all in terms of the pressures on academic freedom? Well, I think you know, generally academic freedom is in a decent state in Canada. And certainly if you look internationally, uh, we're, we're in a relatively good position. Um, there, there are, of course, lots of pressures and concerns about academic freedom. I think one of the principal ones is a structural problem, and that is uh, we have probably a third, if not close to a half of academics now who are hired in short-term contracts. And in that case, if they engage in controversial research or say things that powerful interests don't like, they don't necessarily have to be fired. Their, their contract is simply not renewed. So I think that's just kind of a structural threat to academic freedom. But we also see, and it's not new, uh, lots of pressure from outside forces, whether it's governments, lobby groups, uh, special interests who try to influence uh, what universities uh, and, and colleges pursue. I think you know one of the one of the more troubling aspects of what's happening recently, particularly south of the border, is an increasing and flagrant attempt by legislatures to dictate what can and can't be taught in the lecture halls and laboratories. Uh, You're talking about the critical over, race debate, yeah, critical race uh, theory over, debate. Yeah, yeah. Over half the states now have either uh, adopted or are planning to adopt a legislation that would limit, if not ban, the teaching of so-called critical race theory uh, in, in in classrooms or in universities and colleges. At the same time, they've also adopted positions to say that any university or faculty member who comes out and support of the boycott, div divestment, and sanctions uh, movement, uh, again, critical of the state of Israel, uh, would also be you know, losing potential state funding. So there, there seems to be a double standard in some ways in what's, what's being applied here. Uh, but I, I do worry that uh, what we see in the United States, or in or many of the states, is a pretty flagrant attempt uh, by mostly conservative legislatures uh, trying to limit any kind of critical race theory, anti-colonialism studies, gender studies, the list goes on. So anything that's seen as sort of 
uh, left perspectives, a critical mm-hmm. perspectives are certainly being targeted. Mm-hmm. I, I want to go back to um, the issue at hand around the academic freedom on being able to criticize Israel without, uh, or you know, criticize practices of it and and so on with it, without it being illegal or or stigmatized. Um, in in your experience at the Canadian Association of University Teachers, were you hearing uh, that some or, or a number of professors were feeling that their academic freedom was, was actively being sort of, I mean, what was there pressures on them? And, and if so, wh- where did these pressures come from? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't say I heard overwhelmingly. There's certainly a number of anecdotes that, that I had uh, come come to my attention. Um, and you know, we also dealt with an issue uh, sort of before my time, but uh, there was an issue at York University uh, during the Harper government. Uh, uh, this was a case of a group of academics who were hoping to put on a conference that was sponsored by one of the federal granting agencies, uh, looking at the look, looking at a debate between the one state, two state. Solution. I'm not an expert in Middle East studies, so I don't know all the nuances, but it was basically an academic debate about uh, uh, whether a two-state solution is preferable or a one-state solution is preferable. Uh, some some groups were unhappy with the framing of that particular conference and uh, lobbied the government to lobby the funding agency to pull the funding from it. And there was actually a review undertaken, and I think that was sort of an early warning sign that we actually uh, conducted an investigation into the, into the issue that we published as a book, uh, looking at uh, the influence of various lobby groups and their attempts to, to try and uh, restrict what, what can and can't be debated and discussed and, and taught at universities. And so there was an early warning sign. I've heard other little anecdotes here and there, but I think it's really been the experience of looking at, in other jurisdictions of how a very narrow application of uh, the International Holocaust Remnants Alliance definition uh, would would infringe upon academic freedom. Now, there's lots, or there's elements of the definition that are, I think, fine and relatively uncontroversial, and everyone agrees that anti-Semitism is a problem. It has been a problem for a long time. In fact, for CAUT, some of our early academic freedom cases were around what was clearly discrimination against Jewish academics in Canada. One of our uh, first presidents was Boyle Laskin, who went on to become Supreme Court Justice. Well, Laskin was denied a position at the University of Manitoba uh, because he was Jewish. And when he was hired by the University of Toronto, he was forced to swear a loyalty oath, uh, which no other faculty member at the time had to do. So there's certainly a long history of this, and we're quite concerned about it as an association. The problem is, I think from the, from the perspective of our members, is that the definition is so broad sweeping in that it, it seems to conflate uh, any criticism of the, of the state of Israel or its policies with being anti-Semitic. Uh, I guess the equivalent would be if you were critical of the government of France, does that make you anti-French or anti-Christian? Right. Uh, so I, I think it's the broad sweeping nature of it that people are concerned that it could be used as a kind of hammer uh, to limit uh, or certainly blunt the exercise of academic freedom. Right, right. Uh, Can you tell us if any universities in Canada have adopted the definition? So far, no. There there have have been that I'm aware of. I know there have been uh, recommendations and suggestions that that some should. Uh, I think so far they haven't. Uh, whereas, uh, if you look at the UK, for instance, uh, there uh, there's a directive from the government saying that universities must adopt this. And uh, most recently, uh, I think the that- past month or so, that uh, there, there was a professor at Bristol University, David Miller, That's right. who was accused of being anti-Semitic. Uh, there was an internal investigation. He was cleared of all charges, but he was still let go from his post. Uh, right. Because the university felt that the it, it it took a reputational hit from keeping him on. Right, right, absolutely. Yes, I was I was I was going to be bringing that up. So, so hopefully, um, your uh, challenge to to adopting this definition will be very protective and in the in the step of the right direction in protecting academic freedom at least around this issue. What have you heard back uh, from the institutions that be from the other organizations that you are uh, working with, uh, whether they be government or 
universities or nonprofit? Yeah, our, our, our motion was adopted just a little over a week ago, so there hasn't been a lot of reaction so far. Um, you know, it was it was adopted unanimously, which which surprised me because as you as you know, these, these are controversial issues and topics to, to discuss. Uh, but it was adopted unanimously because I think it was a very carefully worded motion, in the sense that it was focusing on those elements of the definition that, as I said earlier, conflate any criticism of Israeli government policies with anti-Semitism. Um, but I, you know, what, what, but what I hope is that uh, universities will see this uh, as a moment to uphold academic freedom and not to cave in to any particular pressure group or lobby group and recognize that what universities and colleges, why, why they exist, is they're one of the few spaces in our society where we can have these open and frank debates and exchanges uh, without, hopefully, uh, undue influence uh, from outside actors, whether that's government or pressure groups or whatever. Uh, so I'm hopeful that uh, this will help uh, help us uh, ensure that we can continue to have debates and that researchers who engage in critical race theory and anti-colonialism and studies and gender studies and those issues that are often at the center of very controversial debates and often under extreme pressure that we can continue to create a space for those scholars to flourish. Right on, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 certainly there are uh, a, a bunch of issues uh, always at the forefront to to talk about. I mean, we would run out of time if if we started talking about the breadth of of the work um, of your association. But please give listeners an idea of some of the other things that you guys are currently working on. Yeah, well, uh, you know, there's there's certainly a lot. Um, when, when it comes to academic freedom, I would say, aside from this, this particular issue, uh, which has occupied a lot of our time over the past year because of the one case at the University of Toronto, uh, we also have more sort of mundane and run-of-the-mill things uh, where a scholar says something on, on, on Twitter or in the classroom that people object to, uh, and there's an interesting and robust debate about what are the limits of academic freedom and where, where can academic freedom go after this. Uh, you know, we, but we've also worked on a number of policy areas to, to try and ensure that there's strong protection for the professional rights of the academics because really academics are there at the forefront of exploring new ideas. Our, our role is to preserve disseminate and advance knowledge and in order to do that you have to have fairly broad latitude within disciplinary standards to pursue research and investigate in areas that some people may find uncomfortable uh, but hopefully will lead to some advances in our understanding of who we are and why we're here and how can we solve the big issues that are facing us. And so we're just going to leave it there. Thank you so much for um, taking the time out and uh, talking us through the motion that uh, that recently you were challenging the definition and upholding uh, academic freedom for all those that are uh, working on Palestinian issues and quite, quite often then get targeted as being critical to the state of Israel and a number of other things that you guys are working on. It would be lovely to catch up with you as we go down the road. There's so much to talk about. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Take Thank care. You. Good night. And so we have been talking with David Robinson, the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of University Teachers, on their opposition to adopting the IHRA definition. Stay tuned. Uh, we will be coming right back.